Okay, here we are. We're live. All right, so uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to be discussing uh, this in this uh, in this video. Well, not really discussing. I'm just going to be reading the chapter that entitled "To What Extent Did the New Political Settlement Reached in the Years 1992 to 94 Create a Fully Democratic Country?" So that's the kind of inquiry question uh, to have in mind as we uh, go through the chapter. To what extent was um, the the, the uh, settlement reached uh, actually democratic? Um, consider maybe as well, whilst we're going through the kind of compromise compromises made by each side uh, and so on. And just for a bit of background, um, Codessa, which 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 we mentioned at the end of the last video, just a reminder, it stands for the Congress for Democratic South Africa. That was the name for the sort of multi-party talks. Um, that took place beginning in 1991 between primarily the ANC and the National Party, but also a whole bunch of other parties, I think 26 parties in total at one point. So that's Codessa, and that's where this chapter picks up with those talks. Okay, so Codessa, while stop-start, um, meaning that sometimes it was paused, for example, June 1992, the ANC pulled out after the Boipateng massacre, um, Okay, so Codessa, while well, stop start, was a crucial milestone in the path to full democracy in South Africa. The decisions reached during those negotiations enabled elections in April 1994, and to some extent, they also determined the outcome of those elections. However, deals were made to ensure that a government of national unity was established after the election, with ministerial posts for MPs from losing parties. So if you've if you remember, um, if you've seen the fantastic documentary series Nelson Mandela's Fight for Freedom, um, also known originally entitled Death of Apartheid, then the US version, which is available on YouTube, was renamed Nelson Mandela's Fight for Freedom, not to be confused with a BBC documentary of almost exactly the same name. Um, this one is available on SA History Online uh, YouTube channel. Um, and if you remember from that, documentary um, there was it, it talked about the sticking point in the negotiation between the ANC pushing for majority rule meaning whoever wins a majority of seats in the parliament gets to form the government on their own which is similar to what well, that's how, how, it, how it works in most uh, representative democracies including Britain um, whereas the National Party were pushing for um, what they called kind of uh, minority rights or power sharing in which any party with a certain proportion of votes would have a guaranteed place in the government. In other words, you'd have a sort of coalition government. Um, so as it says here, that would include actually ministers, even from parties that lost the election. This was the National Party's way to try and cling on to a bit of political power um, in a post-apartheid settlement. And what it's telling us here is that the deal was made for a government of national unity, where even if the ANC won the elections outright in a landslide, other parties would still be involved in a coalition government, at least for the early stages um, of the post-apartheid settlement. Okay, Codessa negotiations. Codessa started badly with a highly public spat between Mandela and de Klerk. The latter spoke last at the opening ceremony. Mandela claims that he agreed this as a favor to de Klerk in order to cement goodwill. De Klerk decided to open up the most sensitive issue, publicly condemning the ANC for failing to disband MK and remaining committed to violence. He no doubt felt that this would play well to his domestic white audience and also Western powers for whom the armed struggle alongside the communist link had always been a difficult feature of the ANC. So you can see what it's saying. De Klerk was kind of playing, playing to the gallery, as we say. He obviously had a lot of uh, hostility and opposition from within his own party and even more so from the Conservative Party and even more so from virtually neo-Nazi white nationalist formations like the AWB um, who were all attacking him from the right, um, calling him a sellout for negotiating the ANC and so on. So he had to kind of play the, play the hard man, play the tough guy that was not going to bow down to the ANC to sort of appease these constituencies. Okay. Um, Mandela was so incensed that he broke with protocol, strode onto the podium and publicly lambasted de Klerk for misusing the agreement to have the last word. I am gravely concerned about the behavior of Mr. de Klerk today. Even the head of an illegitimate, discredited minority regime as his uh, is, 
has certain moral standards to uphold. Um, so very public spat, as it says, between the clerk and Mandela. Um, this is right at the start of the negotiations, right? Not necessarily a good, a good omen. In his autobiography, Mandela said the clerk began to speak to us like a schoolmaster admonishing a naughty child. He claimed that the government was perpetuating. Uh, he claimed that the government was perpetuating violence and conflict, secretly funding covert organizations, which we now know is true, was true, and facilitating Incarta's vigilantes. Remember the Incarta Freedom Party of Cheek Putalezi, um, who were kind of sending out mobs of sometimes thousands of people into ANC strongholds and conducting. Um, just violence and, and, and massacres and beatings and so on. And th that's also true that, that we now know was done with complicity of some uh, elements of the state and probably all the way up to the clerk himself in the National Party. Such encounters were suffused with tensions about race, about, about the different audiences with which leaders sought to connect uh, and with a concern to occupy the moral high ground. Um, okay. So it's basically just telling us, you know, this with this setting the scene that Kadesa um, started off started off badly. Very this this hostility between de Klerk and Mandela on display for all to see. But then it's also reminding us that when people make these public statements, sometimes that they're 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 appealing to different audiences. Obviously, Mandela has to show to his side that he's not a sellout for talking to de Klerk, and de Klerk has to show to his side that he's not a sellout. So. In a way, they've both got an, uh, an incentive to present themselves as, as very hostile to the other, when actually behind the scenes, it may be that they're actually still able to work quite well together and compromise and so on, but they're kind of obliged to ramp up the um, rhetoric against each other in order to keep their own constituencies on board. Anyway, nevertheless, progress was made at Codessa, meeting in five working committees, and significant agreements were, uh, were reached in the next few months. So when it says five working committees, it means instead of having one big group discussing all the issues, they had five different sort of subgroups. People went off uh, to discuss different issues and come up with proposals like that. There would be, <clears throat> these are the agreements, there would be a single undivided country. So this is already a major um, backtracking from the whole grand apartheid policy of the separate homelands and so on. There'd be one undivided country. And these are the agreements that were made, yeah? A multi-party democracy with a universal non-racial franchise. So again, this is the end of the whole kind of era of the tricameral parliament where, you, oh, you're Indian, you vote for your little Indian parliament and you're black, so you vote for your homeland government. No, one single non-racial franchise. The one parliament or one country, everyone gets one equal vote for that parliament. Um, so this is really, you know, this is, this is a major reversal of everything that, the National Party had been pushing for in the political sphere. Um, a Bill of Rights, uh, separation of powers, which means that the judiciary, the judges, uh, the parliament, who makes the laws, and the, um, the executive, the government, who makes policy, they're kind of separate from each other. Um, it's not one controlling the others. There was a fear, remember, under, um, under particularly under Bota, that the executive powers were being amassed in his hands, that the government was kind of taking control uh, um, of, of policy. It was just bypassing parliament. Um, it was a sort of militarization of government in which parliament was increasingly sidelined. So this is kind of, again, a reversal of that type of, of government to say, no, parliament can't be um, just overruled by the executive, the judges have to be independent, etc. Okay, so separation of powers and an end to racial discrimination. Um, now, okay, so that's on the side, that, the, all of this is a reversal from the apartheid, uh, uh, sort of main period of apartheid. Now, listen to this, very important. This is a major concession from the ANC. So it says, private property, including land and other assets, would be protected. Now, remember the Freedom Charter, which was the basic vision for a future post-apartheid uh, South Africa, adopted by the ANC and its allies in the Indian National Congress, the Congress of Democrats, uh, and so on. Um, this Freedom Charter, of its 10, 10, 10 plans for post-apartheid South Africa, said the land shall go to those who work it. Um, and it said, it said that the, um, the wealth of the country shall belong to all. Um, so 
and really this 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 was seen as evidence of sort of communist influence uh, on the ANC and the Congress Alliance, because what it was it was it was promising was actually in or, or hinting at at least was kind of an end to private property or private ownership of the mines, the mineral resources, the fertile land, and so on in the hands of these few uh, big European-owned corporations. So this is a reversal of that. So this isn't compromised by the ANC. Again, private property, including land and other assets, would be protected. So there would be no redistribution of land. There would be no nationalization of industry and so on. Okay, let's read on. There would be some form of transitional executive council and an independent electoral commission. The National Party held out over the issue of minority rights. So again, this is the sticking point. Minority rights, power sharing, the National Party insisting on some role for them and more generally for, for the white minority in government, even if they lost the elections, which they would because they're a small minority of the population. They wanted a veto over any constitutional proposals by insisting that a 75% majority in parliament should be required. Now, normally in parliament, you elect a parliament who makes the laws and then those, those representatives sitting in parliament, any law that a majority of them want becomes law. So it might only be 51% vote for a law, but that's a majority that becomes law. They're saying, no, constitutional changes should require 75% majority in parliament, which would give them the National Party with their allies, and remember they're in this kind of working alliance with the Encarta Freedom Party as well. Between them, um, they would then be able to, if they got more than 25%, in Parliament, they'll be able to block whatever the ANC wanted to do. They envisaged a form of power sharing rather than a full transfer of power to a majority government that was likely to be dominated by the ANC. So just sort of summing up that little paragraph there, really, so we have on the one hand, on the political sphere, non-racial franchise, um, multi-party democracy, single undivided country, end to the homelands and all of that, um, this is like everything the ANC have been asking for in the political sphere, arguably. On the economic sphere, basically property, mines, farms, etc., would stay in the same hands they always had. Okay, their owners would retain all of that. They wouldn't be redistributed. So that's the comp that's the basic compromise on each side. But still, this sticking point of this issue of minority rights, power sharing, um, should all laws be able to be passed? with a simple majority, or should they require a 75% majority? This was still the sticking point. Okay. Encarta, this, the Zulu Encarta Freedom Party of Chief Butelezi, Encarta tried to entrench the position of the Zulu king. Butelezi argued for a strongly federal system that's, set, that's different from having an undivided country, federal system, where different parts of the country have their own levels of self-government. Some people argue the UK today is moving towards a it's almost federal system because you have the Scottish Parliament making certain different rules for Scotland and so on. Obviously, the famous federal system is the USA, where you know the different states, California, Texas, etc., they all have their certain powers and so on um, that can't be touched by the overall national US government. Excuse me one second. Okay, so Encarta is pushing for a strongly federal system because why do you think that might be? Because Encarta has a lot of power in the Zulu homeland, KwaZulu Natal. So they want to maintain at least some level of that power that they have there to make certain rules and policies in that area. So they're arguing for a strongly federal system and at times seem to favor a semi autonomous greater Zululand. Federalism was also attractive to some homeland leaders for the same reason and other minority groupings um, for different reasons. The white liberal Democratic Party thought that this system would limit centralized power, a danger revealed by the history of National Party rule. So they didn't want to go from a, basically a one-party state of the National Party, who just always in charge and accruing all the power to themselves, to then having a, um, a one-party state, basically, uh, or one-party system under the ANC, where the ANC is just always in charge, which, by the way, is effectively what South Africa has become. Um, ANC's won every election since 1994. Spoiler alert. Um, 
So the de Democratic Party is thinking, well, of a federal system, at least th that single party, if they're in power for years and decades on end, they wouldn't have all the power because there'd be different regional governments that would have some power and having more dispersed power means there's less corruption, less abuse of power and so on. That's basic liberal view. Okay, many Afrikaners thought that even if they could not win a majority, they might, with conservative black allies, uh, achieve influence in some regions such as the Western Cape. So remember on the video, uh, the last part of the death of apartheid called the, La the White's Last Stand, Eugene Terra Blanche uh, and the AWB, they actually form an alliance. They want, they want to carve out a separate Africana state, independent Africana state, uh, and they want to have an alliance with some of the homeland leaders who want to retain their power in their regions. Um, so that's what it's talking about here, about conservative black allies of Africanas. The Africana right, that means Terra Blanche and others, explored the idea of racially based rather than regionally based federalism, but this was not acceptable to the ANC. Okay, so there was, so this paragraph is basically telling us about um, the opposition to the idea of a, a unified, undivided, unitary state um, from various different groups, from the Encarta to the, to the AWB, to the Liberal Democratic Party, for various different reasons, they were sort of fearful of just one single undivided state and want some sort of federal system. Okay, given these disagreements, Codessa was suspended and de Klerk held a whites only referendum in March 1992 on the question, do you support continuation of the reform process, which the state president began on 2nd of February 1990 and which is aimed at a new constitution through negotiation. He's doing this, the referendum just for whites, and he's doing this in order to, in a way, bolster his position. Because remember, he's got the, the right wing, or he's got the AWB, he's got the Conservative Party snapping his heels, calling him a sellout, saying this is not, you're selling out the white population, etc. Even people within his own party starting to say that. So this is him, in a way, trying to gain a mandate for what he's doing, to say, um, no, this, is, this path of negotiations is what white people want, and, and, and to give himself a new mandate for continuing with that. White South Africans took this vote very seriously, and de Klerk won a 69% majority on a high turnout. So they gave him a big, kind of big mandate to, 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 to try and quieten his, his opponents, to say, no, look, this, um, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is what our people want. He held the referendum essentially to negate the challenge of the Conservative Party, which had recently won three by-elections. A by-election is outside when you have a big national election, say you have... A, you, you, an MP dies, and just in one area, in one constituency, they have to replace that MP so they have an election just in that area. The Conservative Party had won three by-elections in a row, so that's obviously worrying the National Party um, and, and worrying de Klerk, thinking, oh, maybe is, maybe is this not popular? Um, so, so de Klerk wanted to demonstrate to his own party, no, this is popular, this path we're following, don't worry about the Conservative Party. He also wanted to defuse right-wing white vigilante groups that were beginning to form. So people associated with AWB and so on. It was an important event because the great majority of whites in voting yes, finally turned their back on apartheid and recognized they would have to relinquish much of their power and privilege. So this is a pivotal moment, this referendum yeah, in March, 1992. But the referendum angered many black people because it excluded them and seemed to suggest the decision to proceed with negotiations was primarily a white decision. The ANC publicly opposed the referendum, but recognized that it was important for de Klerk to win. Okay. Next section is entitled Violence and Popular Mobilization. Codessa II, this is the second round of these talks, reassembled in May 1992, but soon broke down because violence undermined negotiations. In June 1992, residents in the township of Boipateng in the Vile Triangle were massacred by hostile dwellers. Um, Police or, quote, third force collusion was not proven, but was widely suspected. The ANC thought that the government was doing little to control such violence in the hope that it would divide African communities. So remember what was happening here. Like I say, mobs sometimes of a thousand plus um, in, uh, coming from hostels, mainly uh, hostels of, uh, inhabited by Zulu workers, often connected with the Encarta Freedom Party, going into ANC strongholds and um, just, just with you know iron bars and so on, and just uh, just smashing the place up, sometimes killing people, raping people, and so on. Um, 
and the, the the suspicion about the state involvement was the police didn't do anything. Sometimes they'd have to march for quite a long way, you know, armed mobs, and the police just, just stood back and let it happen. In some of the later massacres, the police actually were involved in the massacre directly themselves. The ANC and its allies believed not only that they should try to keep some potential for armed struggle, but also that mass demonstrations and stayaways were essential to keep the political initiative. Many African people were impatient with the long negotiations and groups within the ANC felt that they should have a more revolutionary approach, that they should topple the government rather than negotiate. In Eastern Europe, for example, in Poland and East Germany, mass demonstrations had recently helped to unseat governments. In these cases, ironically, it was regimes sympathetic to the Soviet Union that had been such staunch supporters of the ANC which fell. Throughout the four years of negotiations, elements in the ANC argued strongly for mass action. Ronnie Casrols, one of those arrested for his role in Operation Vula, uh, remember Operation Vula was when the MK fighters were sort of smuggling, uh, the MK leadership uh, were smuggling fight MK fighters inside the country. Um, during the period in which the, AM, the MK had suspended armed struggle, so when this was uncovered, the National Party saw it as bad faith and so on, the ANC argued, well, we, we, never, we never said we were disbanding the MK, we just suspended the armed struggle but they wanted to, to kind of create an MK underground so they're ready, if they did have to go back to fighting, that they'd be ready and prepared. That was Operation Vula. So Ronnie Casero is one of those arrested for his role in Operation Vula, where he was characterized as armed and dangerous, was particularly militant in his approach. Um, <clears throat> one of their key targets was the homeland governments, still seen as props for apartheid and as hostile to ANC mobilization in the rural areas. The ANC fixed on the Siskai, where the self-styled brigadier Gukozo, um, apologies if I'm saying that wrong, is G-Q-O-Z-O, had taken power in a military coup in 1990 and publicly challenged the ANC. Civic organizations and residents associations openly challenged Gukozo and the tribal authorities. They had clearly won a majority of support in this old heartland of the ANC. In September 1992, <clears throat> uh, the ANC organized a huge march of 80,000 people led by Chris Harney, head of the South African Communist Party and the MK, and Ronnie Kazros. Gokozo's troops shot at protesters, killing 29 and injuring over 200. A unit from the South African Defense Force was present but did not intervene. So again, the collusion seems to be pretty clear between the South African government and these uh, and these other groups that are attacking the ANC. And then, of course, this is all pre presented as black on black violence, yeah, because this is this guy, homeland government, that's ostensibly conducting it. The PAC had fared badly in exile, riven by leadership disputes and unable to secure a mass base, a secure base. Most of the militant black consciousness youth who might otherwise have been drawn to PAC found their way into the ANC and MK. On returning from exile, however, the PAC's armed wing, by then renamed the Azanian People's Liberation Army, APLA, A-P-L-A, um, did succeed, it was previously called POCO, did succeed in recruiting locally. The PA, PAC had never restricted itself to sabotage, and it did not suspend the armed struggle as part of the negotiation process, which it largely rejected. In 1993, the APLA staged a number of dramatic attacks on white civilian targets, including a pub in the Eastern Cape where five were killed and a church in Cape Town. These incidents did not attract significant support amongst black South Africans who were generally moving in a different direction. So the PAC is kind of positioning itself here as you know, the, 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 the sort of party holding out against the sellout as they would have portrayed it of the ANC. But if it's not really working, they're not gaining much support for that. Um, it seems to be that the population were more behind the ANCs uh, strategy, which remember at this time is a combination of negotiations and mass action, strikes, demonstrations, civil disobedience, and so on. So they're still, the ANC is still able to keep the militant youth on board largely with these kind of tactics, um, whilst even, even whilst the armed struggle is suspended. Multi-party talks were restored at the beginning of 1993, and strong personal links forged between two of the chief negotiators, Cyril Ramaphosa of the ANC, and Rolf Meyer of the National Party. And again, Death of Apartheid, White's Last Stand, available on YouTube, very good on this dynamic between these two and the implications of that. 
They were deeply conscious of being part of a historically significant process that was attracting intense international attention. The process was nearly undermined again in April 1993. White right-wing white, uh, right renegades, an English spoker and a Pole rather than African honors, assassinated Chris Harney, seen as one of the most central figures in the new generation of ANC and MK leaders. So really pivotal moment. Chris Harney was um, one of the most respected leaders uh, in all in, in, in the ANC and in the MK, support amongst ordinary fighters, support amongst rank and file grassroots members of the ANC, um, probably after Mandela, perhaps the second most sort of respected member uh, of the ANC and MK amongst the grassroots. And of course, he was leader of the Communist Party at this time as well. So um, yeah, it's in interesting to see how history might have been different had he survived, but he didn't, he was assassinated. And as it says, um, South Africa truly stood uh, on the edge at that moment with the possibility of a mass armed uprising. The, uh, the, there was this possibility, okay, they've, they've killed our leader, let's turn back to armed struggle. Um, and I believe that actually this was part of the um, the reasoning for uh, the the assassins to actually kill Chris Hani in the first place. They were hoping that would sort of force the ANC to respond, and then the good negotiations would, would collapse because these were basically right wing white, white nationalists who assassinated him, who were opposed to the negotiation process. So by killing him, they're trying to goad the ANC into returning to the armed struggle to undermine the negotiations. Obviously, Mandela, very wily uh, political operator, saw through that. So Mandela made a televised address, which successfully appealed for calm. By the way, the um, the man who organized, the, the, the actual guy who pulled the trigger, a poll, uh, was caught eventually, I'm not sure how, how long later, sentenced and so on. I believe, um, I, and, and the, the guy who paid him, and the kind of organizer of the, of the assassin, who was actually a conservative party MP, I believe, um, there's an interview you can find on YouTube. I'll try and post it up. You can find an interview of him where he explains blatantly, yeah, he did it and why he did it. It's quite, um, it's a little bit disturbing, but it's, it's quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Mandela appealed for calm. The Afrikaner Weirstand Bewigging. Be Again, apologies to any Afrikaners listening for my um, mangling of your language. The AWB, um, a paramilitary white movement also threatened violent reprisals. They later briefly invaded the talks um, and assisted the leader of Bafuthatswana homeland government, Lucas Mangope, in an attempt to stay in power. Again, all this is covered excellently in that death of apartheid white slice stand. So please do watch that if you haven't. These threats, together with the PAC killings, the intensity of mass protests and the civil conflict in the townships, so that's all still going on. Remember the townships, have become ungovernable since 1985, really. They've been completely, virtually no-go areas for the for the army and the police. Um, if they do go in, they go in in armored vehicles, tanks and so on, and just get pelted with, with uh, stones and petrol bombs every inch of their journey. So that's still going on in the townships. Um, so, so all of this is going on, seem to open the abyss of uncontrolled violence and civil war. So as I always say, when we look at the kind of end game of apartheid, the last couple of years, you know, don't be, don't think, oh, okay, Mandela's out, the ANC's um, unbanned, they're negotiating. It's just a sort of smooth now, just smooth kind of process of working towards the end of apartheid. It didn't feel like that at the time. Political violence was higher than ever. These massacres becoming almost monthly affairs. PAC, deep in armed struggle. The townships flaring up permanently. Um, and uh, yeah, this 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 kind of ethnic violence of Zulu hostile dwellers and these attacks on ANC uh, uh, strongholds and so on, uh, and there's still these sticking points in the negotiations between the ANC and the National Party over this issue of minority rights, power sharing, etc. So it was still it, was, it still felt like it was all on a knife edge. That at any moment it could just return to all out conflict, and even. If it didn't, already the political violence was at an all-time high. So the need, as it says, the need for negotiations now seemed more urgent than ever. Okay, so that whole section there is really just uh, explaining that, that the various elements of, of violence that are ongoing, PAC, um, the issue with the Encarta-backed um, hostile dwellers, uh, <coughs> 
this pressure within the ANC, there's the mass actions and civil disobedience they're uh, dealing with, and then you've got the AWB uh, and their attempts to scupper the talks, the assassination of Chris Harney. So all of this is still going on. Okay, next section, constitutional agreement and elections. In April 1993, a multi-party negotiating forum was established to take up the agreements reached at Codessa, and it quite quickly formed a negotiating council and six technical committees. By June 1993, they were able to set a date for a non-racial <coughs> uh, democratic elections in April 1994. This was essential in providing a clear process of peaceful electoral politics around which the various parties could mobilize their resources and direct their political energies. Boutalese proved to be the most in, uh, intransigent and removed Encarta from much of the negotiation, negotiating process. So Encarta is now pulled out of the talks, okay? Quite, a, quite an ominous sign, actually, because if they're not involved in negotiations, how are they going to try and influence events? Is it going to be through violence, force, etc.? In fact, his participation in the first election was in doubt until very soon before, and it was only a guarantee of recognition of the Zulu king that led him to compromise. So he did get this, he did get something, he did get a concession that the Zulu king would would would, would retain some influence. Yeah, and of course, Butelezi was not the Zulu king, by the way. He was, a, he was a chief, but he had a lot of influence over the king. So this was a concession to Butelezi that encouraged him to then stand in the elections. There was a fear that if he boycotted them, it could lead to electoral violence and so on. Inkata did stand in the end. Negotiators, negotiators also established a transitional executive committee in September 1993, which began to take control of government. In many respects, this accorded with the National Party's aim of power sharing rather than a transfer of power, but it was a temporary measure. Simultaneously, the various parties negotiated a detailed interim constitution. Interim means basically just a sort of temporary, temporary constitution before they could hammer out a final constitution. Constitution, by the way, just means the kind of rules of how the country's governed, just the kind of political arrangements of the country. An interim constitution was established in no November 1993. At its proclamation, both Mandela and de Klerk spoke passionately for national unity while violence still raged around them. They had jointly been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for 1993. Three such prizes were awarded to black South Africans. Uh, Latuli, that's Albert Latuli, um, who was president of uh, the ANC, I believe at the, the, the foundation of apartheid in 1948, around that time. Tutu, that's Desmond Tutu, the um, Christian uh, church leader, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, who was a sort of supporter of the UDF and that whole mass movement in the 80s, and Mandela, who we know. This was one indication of the global significance of the fight to end apartheid, because obviously the Nobel Peace Prize is an international global prize. The Constitution, brackets Acts 200 of December 1993, could only be an interim measure, temporary measure, because it had been achieved by negotiation and had not yet been approved by the people in an election. It entrenched a common citizenship for all, so this is an end to your citizenship, you know, having different degrees and rights attached to it according to your race, end to all of that, common citizenship for all, and particularly strong human rights. The document was regarded internationally as a model constitution in this respect. Both sides made concessions in the final constitutional arrangements, but ultimately it was clear that in achieving a fairly centralized unitary state and non-racial universal franchise in which all adults had the vote, the ANC was very likely to take power. Um, so you see what it's saying is basically, you know, you've got just one, you haven't got different regions or different racial groups electing their own different governments, you've just got one government. So clearly the black majority are going to be the, the key electoral force there's just one government and everyone has an equally weighted vote. Black populations, I think about 80% of the population at that time. And within the black population, the ANC's pa uh, power and, and uh, support is, you know, near um, hegemonic at this time, is very strong and widespread. So by agreeing those two things, a non-racial franchise on the one hand and a unitary centralized state on the other, it's almost guaranteeing that the ANC is going to take power. That's what it's saying. The electoral system, based on proportional representation and national party lists, also favoured the big parties and their leaderships, but arguably the ANC could have done even better if it pursued a constituency-based system. This is getting into sort of political technical details here. We didn't really need to worry about too much, I think. Um, 
the point is other types of voting system, such as the British one, um, tend to favor big parties like the ANC even more um, than, the, than, than they would otherwise do. Um, but I don't think we need to worry too much about that for now. Okay, de Klerk wanted an extended transition period with a rotating presidency. This was not acceptable. So rotating presidency would swap. Presidency would swap every year or a few years or something, um, presumably between Mandela and de Klerk, presumably. This was not acceptable to the ANC, but they did compromise because Mandela in particular was anxious to keep the peace, foster national reconciliation, and to keep white skills in the government and the country. So obviously, you know, the black population being completely excluded even from voting, let alone even having any low level of government experience. Okay, there were some, uh, you know, black civil servants and so on, uh, and, and people in governing positions in the homelands. But in terms of in national government, there was no black people allowed to have ever had any experience in that. So the only people with experience in running the government, um, running the civil service, that's the state bureaucracy, and so they're all white. So Mandela thought, well, these are the people of experience. We need to keep some of them on board. Their skills, experience are valuable. Okay. Um, following a proposal by Joe Slovo, dubbed a sunset clause, the ANC agreed to an interim government of national unity. This would incorporate all the major parties with 5% of the vote for up to five years after the first election. So literally 5% of the vote, that's one in 20 votes. If your party achieves that, you get a seat in the government. Um, <clears throat> but this is just for the first five years, right? That's, after that, the arrangement fades away like the setting sun, as Joe Slovo poetically put it. Both the National Party and Encarta Freedom Party held cabinet positions after 1994, and de Klerk became one of two deputy presidents, so they did have this power sharing for a time. There were other elements of protection, for example, guaranteeing the pensions of white civil servants. This gave them security, but there were advantages for the ANC. One of their primary aims was to Africanize the largely white bureaucracy without causing too much conflict. And this measure was an encouragement for whites to retire. So they wanted quickly the ANC to get black Africans experienced in, uh, in, in managing the state, uh, operating government, being part of the civil servant service. Um, so the, the white civil servants who were already doing all of that were worried we're all gonna be sacked. So they were so they were so they were sort of holding out against some of this. So this was an attempt to appease them, to say, look, you get your full pension, you can retire now on your full pension, and that was a way to sort of in, appease them. Don't worry, you're not going to be just sacked and chucked under the scrap heap of unemployment and become a beggar. Don't worry, you'll have your pension, um, and it was a way of also encouraging them to to retire so that black people could then take their place and they could build up more of a black bureaucracy, train black people in this work that they've been excluded from for all that, uh, all those years. The constitution gave the president considerable power, but the ANC agreed to other measures that would protect the compromises of 1994 and constrain a more revolutionary transformation of the country. These included a bill of rights, an independent constitutional court, strongly advocated by the Democratic Party, and a provision that constitutional amendments required support of two thirds of the new parliament. So this again, this was a compromise towards, remember it's, it's not exactly what the National Party wanted. The National Party said constitutional changes should only be allowed if 75% of the parliament vote for them. Two thirds is more like 67%, right? So it's a compromise on both sides to say, okay, if there's a constitutional change, it will need 67% of, um, of, uh, of the parliament's support, which probably would mean, by the way, it's very unlikely that the ANC alone would get 67% of the seats. It would probably mean the ANC, if they want to change the constitution, would need to make some alliances with other parties. Okay, so perhaps most important for white South Africans, the ANC agreed to the protection of property of all kinds. Again, this major compromise. And if this is a very detailed and, and, and technical, this chapter, but for, for my money, the basic, basic, if you want to really take it down to basics, the basic compromise made during this whole period was that Black Africans would get their political rights, but the white property owners would keep their property. There wouldn't be a redistribution of wealth. There would be uh, uh, an attempt, there would be a chance for black people to, to vote in the government. But in terms of the economic sphere, basically the property would remain in private hands. Now, so that's the basics, right? That's the sort of basic, basic agreement, I would argue. 
Now there has there have there are black billionaires now, and surprise, surprise, Cyril Ramaphosa was one of the first, the guy who negotiated this this settlement on the behalf of the ANC and is now president uh, of, of South Africa today. Um, so I'm not saying like all property would still remain white forever, um, but there wouldn't be a redistribution to the masses, to the grassroots, to the ordinary people. There won't be a nationalization of industry to say that, you know, the wealth of this mine will go to the whole country, will go to everyone. Now it would remain privately owned. Now, obviously, if you if you're a powerful figure, in the new in in the new arrangements and so on and you could maneuver and you could make your money you could buy shares even as a black person you could buy shares if you're rich enough in, in, the, in the mining corporations and so on um but the but the point is the private property remained it wouldn't be redistributed to the poor and the poor then and now overwhelmingly uh, black in south africa okay so ANC agreed to the protection of property of all kinds. White South Africans would not be forced to give up their economic gains from the apartheid era, even though black South Africans had been disadvantaged in many ways in law. For example, Africans had not been able to own property in the cities, and unlike whites, were therefore not able to accumulate capital through this route in families. So despite apartheid, what it's saying is despite the fact that apartheid impoverished the black population um, and benefited the white population, there wouldn't be any adjustment of that. There wouldn't be any a recognition of that through a redistribution that, that wasn't going to happen. South Africa's election was controlled by the domestically constituted independent electoral commission. There was not time to develop a voter's role and all that was needed was an identity card. In this sense, apartheid's bureaucratic thoroughness left a valuable legacy because the great majority of black people had an identity document. Remember the past laws. Um, so what's saying is that and it made voting easier because everyone had their ID, their pass, their passbook. There are a number of recorded irregularities, but all parties agreed that the outcome was a reasonable representation of the support they commanded. The ANC won 62.6% .6 of the vote, including the great majority of non-Zulu speaking Africans. Remember, the, amongst the Zulu population, they were largely behind uh, the Ankata Freedom Party. But amongst all the other uh, ethnic uh, groups in Black South Africa, ANC won an overwhelming majority. The CP, that's the Communist Party, and COSATU, that's the Congress of South African Trade Unions, retained a separate organizational identity but contested the election behind the ANC as part of a tripartite alliance, right? So the Communist Party, COSATU, backed the ANC. The National Party won 20.4%, broadly speaking, the white vote, plus a significant proportion of colored and Indian voters. Really interesting. So this suggests that perhaps some of Bota's reforms, uh, the tripartite um, parliament and so on, had paid had paid dividends. The National Party had managed to gain a certain constituency and following amongst colored and Indian voters. Um, and again, this was this was largely in this new new period, because they perhaps feared that, you know, that remember under apartheid they had certain privileges, not as many as the white population, but compared to the black Africans. And obviously, perhaps they thought supporting the National Party would help protect some of their little privileges against this tide of, of black majority rule that might threaten them. Inkata won 10.5%, probably more than half of Zulu speakers. Support for right-wing Afrikaners dropped from about 600,000 to 425,000, and this now translated into 2% of the vote for the Freedom Front, that's AWB and all of, all of that. Lot. So... Yeah, so just over 60% for ANC, just over 20% for National Party, 10% for Encarta. So the 62.6% uh, that the ANC won, you know, over, it's a big majority. In the UK, by the way, no party has won a majority, has won more than half the vote since 1935. But the ANC won 62.6% .6 of the vote. Not enough, though, to do those constitutional changes, which, remember, required two-thirds of the seats in Parliament, 67%. Um, so they were powerful, but they couldn't just change the constitution, the, you know, the, 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 the rules around how the country's governed. They couldn't do that on their own. Okay, perhaps most surprising were the weak results of the Liberal Democratic Party and the PAC. The Democratic Party received only 1.7% of the vote. Clearly, the National Party appealed successfully for unity amongst the minorities, that is, the whites, the coloreds, and the Indians, in the hope that it would secure them some protection and influence. This was in some senses surprising because the National Party had directly discriminated against colored and Indian people over a long period. 
In later years, the Democratic Alliance displaced the National Party as the major opposition. Support for the PAC dwindled to 1.25%, so that they barely secured representation in Parliament at all. Their hostility to the negotiation process, disorganisation, commitment to violence, and radical policies were clearly out of tune with the moment, and they did not again become a force in South African politics. Okay, last two pages. Okay, next section. The government of national unity and international recognition. In the negotiation process, the four provinces and 10 homelands were recombined as nine provinces. And these were given provincial executives and legislatures, as well as important responsibilities in areas of social provision, such as health and education. So it wasn't technically a federal system, but these nine parts of the country had what we might call extensive local government powers, right? So, you know, local government, like whatever, Oxford City Council runs the bins, does the roads, the libraries, etc. They had a lot more power than that, these different, these sort of regional governments, local governments, these provinces, a bit more power over things like health and education. In the 1994 election, the ANC won seven provinces of the nine, while the National Party won the Western Cape and Inkata won KwaZulu-Natal. Given that the overall ANC victory was widely expected, the result in certain respects was a good outcome for political stability. The ANC did not win a two-thirds majority and so could not easily make constitutional changes without support from other parties. Its power was constrained by this, as well as by the, the government of national unity, as the coalition government that they agreed to in Slovo's sunset clause. The National Party and Inkata both felt included in post-apartheid South Africa and could become part of the political process. So remember, this was the danger of the, of the ANC pushing too hard for just saying, no, we're the majority, we want everything. The danger would alienate these major um, significant political forces and push them into being what we call sometimes spoilers. Perhaps they'd involve themselves in sabotage and armed struggle of their own against the UNC government. That didn't happen because they were part of the political process. They were part of the government. They had some power and influence uh, through those means. Ironically, both, it means both National Party and Encarta, both were soon to lose support. The National Party decided to extract itself from the government of national unity in 1996. Remember, they'd been guaranteed a place for five years in the government, but they pulled out after two. And without the ballast of power and patronage, it rapidly lost support to the Democratic Party. And Carter's vote gradually dwindled, and it lost control of KwaZulu-Natal in 2004, 10 years after the end of apartheid. Mandela became South African president with Thabo Mbeki and F.W. de Klerk as deputies. Mandela especially saw reconciliation as a central goal. The compromises made in the negotiations ensured that, at least in the short term, South Africa experienced a political transition rather than a revolution. For some of those who had been involved in the struggle against apartheid, this was not a sufficiently dramatic transformation, and whites seemed to be left with too much influence and too much control of the commanding heights of the economy. Supporters of the National Party in particular, as well as members of the police and army, seemed to be absolved of responsibility for the past. However, the settlement did provide a period of stability for a country wracked by conflict and violence. So this, and this is the sort of critique of Mandela that that that, that many people have, such as uh, where there is criticism of Mandela, and this whole process is that he sacrificed too much in the interests of reconciliation, peace, and peace. So he achieved all that. He achieved stability, peace, certain amount of reconciliation. You know, they didn't it didn't break down into some sort of race war or anything like that, because he was basically Mandela sort of pursued a policy of, 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 of sort of really forgiveness, keep your property and we'll forgive you for your crimes against us. And for a lot of people, this was not acceptable or, or this was too high a price to pay. You know, they'd come all this way. So many families had lost people, tortured to death, um, uh, you know, by the, the, the government sponsored death squads um, uh, and, and so on. And it just seemed like too much of a price to pay. So the Truth and Reconciliation Committees that were set up seemed to prioritize truth over justice. So basically, there was effectively more or less, I'm going to come to this in a minute, but more or less an amnesty. So anyone who committed crimes, any of those police, army who committed torture, abductions, kidnappings, murders um, in South Africa and across the region, who you know, the people who'd uh, blown up people like Ruth first with letter bombs and so on. All of these people were just, nothing happened to them. They just let off scot-free. 
um, and all of the uh, the wealthy corporations who'd supported apartheid, they get to keep all of the wealth that they'd built on the blacks of, on the backs of super exploited black labor. So really, the, these are the two aspects of the compromise that a lot of people found very difficult to swallow, that, that there was no justice for those who, who'd, who'd, who'd been responsible for the atrocities of apartheid, that was number one. And number two, that the, 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 the wealth that had been built up by apartheid was allowed to be kept by those who'd supported apartheid all along. So, yeah, that, and that, that was the, the heart of the compromise. Okay, with a large majority in parliament, control of cabinet and the legislative agenda, that means ability to propose laws, the ANC was free to dismantle the remains of apartheid and to pass a great range of legislation. For a country that had been locked in one of the most rigid systems of racial legislation, the abolition of apartheid and legal discrimination was a major victory. The majority party, supported by African people, gained political control, and this immediately set the basis for more fluid racial interactions. The ANC quickly passed a Restitution of Land Rights Act designed to compensate for the worst examples of forced removal from land, <coughs> and a Truth and Reconciliation Act designed to research and expose the worst excesses of apartheid. Yes, expose them, but not bring justice. Um, and the Land Rights Act, by the way, the land policy the ANC came to adopt was based on what they called willing buyer, willing seller. So land would change hands, but only if the person who owned it was up for selling it. Um, so it's not really the kind of land. A lot of people felt this is a portrayal of the Freedom Charter. Land to those who work it is not the same as saying those with money can buy it from those who want to sell it. It's not really the same thing. Desmond Tutu, leading anti-apartheid spokesman, Nobel Prize winner, 1984, and Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, 1986-96, named his book about the political struggle in South Africa, The Rainbow People of God, 1994. He offered a vision developed by Mandela of a rainbow nation in which people of different identities and colors could live together peacefully. It was an appealing metaphor, widely quoted, and became part of the way that South Africans talked about themselves was also an appropriate metaphor because, as in the rainbow, uh, <clears throat> the different colors and identities in South Africa, both white and black, did not suddenly disappear. Economic as well as racial inequalities remained a central legacy of apartheid. COSATU, Congress of South African Trade Unions, had grown from 460,000 members in 1985 to 1 1.3 million in 1994, so almost doubled, well, over, over, more than doubled, in fact since its formation in 85. Now part of the ruling tripartite alliance, it secured legislation uh, favorable to the unions and organized labor. By the way, tripartite, don't be confused with the um, tricameral parliament. Tri just means three, tripartite means three parties, three groups involved. The tripartite alliance was the alliance of three groups, the Communist Party, the ANC and COSATU, that's all it means. In the early years of post-apartheid South Africa, Black workers experienced rising living standards and gained enhanced rights. State employment was rapidly Africanized to provide new opportunities for hundreds of thousands of black people. These measures benefited employed and educated people, but with unemployment at over 25% and deep rural poverty, many fell outside of their reach. The ANC prioritized social spending on housing, education, health and welfare, particularly state pensions, in an attempt to start the long and difficult road towards addressing poverty and inequality. These proved to be particularly intractable problems. The transition to full democracy ensured acceptance and support from the international community, including Western democracies, the Commonwealth, African nations and the rising Eastern powers of China, India and Russia. The ANC and Mandela worked hard to ease the transition internationally, to pay tribute to those who had supported the struggle against apartheid. That was a brilliant video you've got to see, by the way, of Mandela when he goes to the USA. And some, some, some right-wing American journalists say, you know, oh, I heard that you were saying nice things about Gaddafi's Libya um, and Castro's Cuba. You know, why, why are you saying nice things about these horrific authoritarian governments? And I'm not going to tell you Mandela's response. I'll just say, watch the video. Um, okay, in this, they were highly successful. Mandela received rapturous support on many of his foreign visits as the new head of state. Investment returned and economic boycotts uh, were ended. South Africa was again allowed to compete in the sporting arena and the country hosted the Rugby World Cup in 1995, which they won, uh, and the Cricket World Cup in 1999. After the elections, 
South Africa was readmitted into several regional and global initiatives. On the 23rd, so remember, because South Africa, remember, had been subject to quite severe sanctions, right, from starting, you know, in fields of sport and so on, from very minor ways from the early 70s, ramping up through the 70s, and then particularly from 84, 85, serious economic sanctions began to be uh, applied. So after 1994, is now a case of, 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 of reintegrating into the international community where it had been isolated. Okay, so after the election, South Africa was readmitted into several regional and global initiatives. On 23rd of May, 1994, South Africa became the 53rd member of the African Union, dramatically altering its relationship with the continent. The African Union, by the way, began as the Organization of African Unity, uh, which was founded on this very day, by the way, as, as coincidentally, uh, the 25th of May in, I think, um, I think 1963. I'm not 100% sure the year. I think it was 63. But um, yeah, founded by Kwame Nkrumah, uh, leader of Ghana, who, remember, led the first successful independence movement in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, leading to Ghana become the first country to win its independence from the British Empire in 1957, the first sub-Saharan African country to do so. So that's the background of the African Union. It's got a radical pan-Africanist heritage. Okay, so South Africa's now joining that. Um, in August 1994, South Africa became a member of the Southern African Development Community, SADC, which strengthened social, political, and economic ties with other countries in the region, with whom South Africa had had a particularly fractious relationship over the previous few decades. South Africa, part of the reason for the formation of SADC was so that the other countries in Southern Africa could reduce their economic dependence on South Africa, actually, and increase trade links and so on. And the South African Defense Forces re regularly bombed those trade links that SADC was trying to create to prevent them from achieving their independence and, and, main, and make sure they kept being dependent on South Africa. Um, so, yeah, okay, so conclusion. South Africa experienced an extraordinary transition. In 1948, a minority government of Afrikaners, uh, representing barely 12% of the total population, had embarked on a journey which isolated the country and left a long shadow. Their policy of apartheid was based on rigid ideas about race and ethnicity, they reserved full political rights for those classified as whites and protected them by discriminating against others. In the long term, the National Party promised to subdivide the country and provide alternative independent homelands for black people. However, most black people experienced apartheid as severely repressive. Most rejected the inequalities imposed on them. The homelands were by no means an equal division of the land and resources of the country. In any case, the great majority were committed to South Africa remaining a single country. In the 1950s, African nationalism increasingly attracted a, a mass following as African people saw themselves as black South Africans. Although, as, and it means what it means by that, is that they saw themselves as black South Africans rather than primarily as Zulus or Hosa uh, people, etc. Although the ANC split and was banned, this phase of political mobilization provided the roots of the political transition during the 1990s. The popular struggle against apartheid within and outside the country was a major and sustained global movement for human rights and political equality. It was threatened by intransigence and civil conflict, yet most whites saw that they had little option but to relinquish political power. And the ANC leadership, particularly Nelson Mandela, understood the need for compromise and reconciliation. The relatively peaceful negotiations in South Africa and the non-racial democratic political outcome represented an achievement not only for South Africans, but for the world as a whole. So there you go. That is the end of the textbook, at least the basic text of the textbook. I missed out. There's a few sources in there. There's some questions and so on. There's some exam tips. When I say conclusion there, I would say there wasn't a conclusion. It wasn't a conclusion to the, to the question that the chapter set itself at the beginning, which let's remind ourselves was to what extent did the new political settlement reached in the years 1992 to 94 create a fully democratic country? It didn't really give a conclusion to what extent uh, a fully democratic country was reached. That is something for us to consider and discuss in future lessons for those of you in my class. I'd maybe discuss uh, amongst your own circles for those of you who are not um, anyone else viewing. Uh, but yeah, those are those are th that's something that we will come to consider and discuss uh, based on your understanding and reflections on this information we've just had. Like I said, to supplement this. Uh, 
this little video here, please do make sure you've watched um, uh, part three, which focuses on this period, 92 to 94, part three of uh, Death of Apartheid, also known as Man Nelson Mandela's Fight for Freedom. That just part three is available on YouTube as a standalone separate es episode. It's called Death of Apartheid, The White's Last Stand. Brilliant piece of documentary making. But in my opinion, probably better than the chapter actually for not just obviously for bringing to life all of that uh, period, but also actually for understanding the complexities of it. Um, watch that. And then what was I going to post? I was going to post a clip of Mandela and I was going to post clip of the guy who ordered the assassination of Chris Hahn. So I'll do that now. Thanks for listening.